Back in 2014, I stumbled across a very interesting video on YouTube. One that I wasn't really ready for. And to be honest, kind of disturbed me. It was a scene from a claymation movie called The Adventures of Mark Twain. Sounds innocent enough, right? Well, I hope y'all are ready for a large dose of existential dread. Fools. What fascinations there are on this planet. Strange mortals with curious customs. <laughs> Isn't that great? Like, could you imagine being a parent and walking in on your kid watching television, and then some character named Satan shows up on the screen? That is amazing! I would be a very bad parent. How annoying that sound Needless to say, this scene left quite the impression on me. And, as of late, a bunch of other people too. I've recently been getting a lot of requests asking me to look into this film. Funny enough, I spoke about this scene briefly in a video of mine back in 2015. But it was specifically the Satan part. The movie the scene is from has a lot more to it, and it's very unique. I mean, we're talking about a claymation film that's based on the writings of Mark Twain that range from happy-go-lucky Tom Sawyer all the way to an angel who preaches about the futility of human existence and that life itself is only a vision, a dream. Nothing exists save empty space and you. And you are but a thought. Uh, let's go check it out! So before I talk about the folks behind this movie, I think it's only fair to give Mark Twain a shout out. So yeah, uh, go hit up Mark Twain's Twitter, his uh, TikTok, his OnlyFans. Like I said before, this entire film is based on the writings of Mark Twain and even features some of his more obscure work. For those who don't know, Mark Twain was a famous writer from the 19th century and is often referred to as the father of American literature. Despite his accomplishments, the guy had a tough life. He went bankrupt, three of his four kids died young, and his wife died at the age of 58. So it really should be no surprise that some of his stories were bleak and dark. Mark Twain was also very critical of religion, which really shows in some of his writings as well, especially The Mysterious Stranger. We'll get to that in a bit. But yeah, Mark Twain was a very fascinating person, and it would take another creative titan to bring a movie, such as this, to life. Enter Will Venton, the father of claymation. Hmm, lots of fathers ofs in this video. What would I be? The father of fur? No, no, not that. Well, Will here is the guy responsible for the California Raisins and the Noid. A avoid the Noid. Perhaps it was the Noid who should have avoided me. The guy literally used clay to make his creations, pulling off amazing effects and beautiful scenes. The cloud sequence at the end of the Mark Twain movie is downright gorgeous. And it just might be my favorite claymation creation ever. Well, besides Clay Fighter. I was fortunate enough to find an interview with Will from awn.com. I'll link the interview in the description for those who want to read it. In it, Will shares how the Mark Twain movie was a request from a producer named Hugh Kennedy. The guy was apparently a massive Mark Twain fan and wanted to talk Will into doing a movie about Mark Twain's stories. Will said that he wasn't too familiar with Mark Twain's writings, but after reading The Diary of Adam and Eve, he realized that there was a very unique film that could be made. So Will, with his own production studio, went to work on the film and did so with a very small team and a very small budget. For those who don't know, claymation is basically stop-motion animation, which is, quote, a filming technique in which successive positions of objects, such as clay models, are photographed to produce the appearance of movement. Needless to say, Will and his team worked incredibly hard on the film and made something truly unique. After four long years of production, the movie was completed in 1984, though it wouldn't be released until 1986, since that's when Halley's Comet would be passing by Earth again. I like that, since the movie itself is entirely based on Halley's Comet and how Mark Twain actually died the last time it came by. Seems poetic. Unfortunately for Will and his movie, the film had a limited release 
and didn't do so well in theaters. According to Will, the distributors for the movie did not tell him that their company was filing for bankruptcy. I guess Will and Mark here have a lot more in common than I thought. Well, Will said that the film got shafted with its release and wasn't able to build a strong audience, though the movie definitely had its hardcore fans, and it also received great reviews. Oh, and get this, the creator of Hey Arnold, Craig Bartlett, worked on this movie. It's super cool because the first version of Hey Arnold was originally done in claymation, so that's pretty interesting. But unfortunately for Will, bad luck would follow him going into the future. Again, he was able to find success with animating company mascots, and also worked on a Fox show called The PJs. Yeah, remember that? Holding down a cardboard condo, homeboy in a homemade bungalow. In the middle of the end of the day, in one place. But sadly for Will, he continued to have financial problems. In the late 90s, Phil Knight, the owner of Nike, became the majority shareholder of Will Studio and Will was eventually dismissed from the company. Phil Knight then put his son, Travis Knight, in charge. And get this, the studio that was Will Vinton's, it would turn into Leica. Going into this movie, researching it, I had no clue that this studio would become this studio. Completely caught me off guard. But I can only imagine the mixed feelings that Will had when he got kicked from his own studio. We're gonna sashay on over there hog tie Mr. Twain and hijack this here ship. Will would go on to create another studio, which made a handful of shorts. But in 2008, Will retired from his long career in animation and, unfortunately, would die due to cancer in 2018 at the age of 70. Well, rest in peace, Will. You were truly a unique artist, and you definitely made a mark on the history of animation. I have never seen an atom of truth that there is a future life. Yet I am strongly inclined to expect one. Anyway, don't be such a sissy in the face of a real adventure. <laughs> All right, so what's this movie about? Like I said before, this film is based on multiple stories from Mark Twain and his characters. I guess you could call it the Mark Twain Expanded Universe. Yeah, eat that, Marvel. The film starts off with a scrolling text telling us about Mark and his actual comments about Haley's Comet. How, quote, The Almighty has said no doubt, now there are these two unaccountable freaks. They came in together, they must go out together. So the story itself centers around Mark Twain and his pursuit of the comet. He pilots this flying dirigible, like, it's almost like imagine a steamboat, but in the air. That's what it was. Before he takes off, though, you've got Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, and Becky Thatcher who sneak on board. So already, off the bat, we're getting that meta nature coming in. It's even funny because when the kids are like, oh, sorry, Mr. Twain, we did not know. Mark Twain is like, ah, oh, yes, Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn, you rascal, and Becky Thatcher, my dear, how are you? And the kids are all like, how does he know us? Boy. Tom, Huck, Mark Twain, <laughs> and Becky Thatcher. How do you know our name? Hello, my angelfish. As the ship takes off, we see this mysterious figure walking around in the shadows that will come into play here later on in the film. So throughout the movie, these three kids are told stories from Mark Twain. Sometimes the stories are told by Mark Twain saying, here's a book, take a look. In other moments, there's a room that loads up the books it's kind of like, I would say, a holodeck from Star Trek. That's exactly what it is, actually, where it loads up the story. Look! That was close. I don't ever want to meet that guy again. The first story the kids visit is The Celebrated Jumping Frog, which to me, personally, I thought that was fine. It wasn't anything super exciting. It wasn't anything that was terrible. It was just a nice average story to get things moving along. I do like how these guys, when they move their mouth, you don't see their mouth, it's their mustache instead. That's cool, that's a nice touch. So between each story, we see the ship continue its voyage towards Halley's Comet. We also get a bunch of quotes from Mark Twain, which, by the way, are actual quotes from Mark Twain. No doubt the Almighty has said here, here goes those two unaccountable freaks. They came in together, they must go out together. 
The next big story we jump into is The Diaries of Adam and Eve, which is, in my opinion, the slowest part of the movie. I'm not saying that it's bad. It's not. It's that it drags a bit. There are moments where I feel like it's slow. The pace is kind of just not really keeping me interested compared to other parts in the film. That being said, it's interesting seeing this movie's interpretation of the days of creation and going off of Mark Twain's writings, where you got like God who's like, oops, I made a mistake. Didn't mean to do that. Oops. What am I doing? There. Okay. You also got Adam and Eve here who are wearing outfits. You gotta clothe them up for the kids. But after that comes the best part of the entire film, the mysterious stranger. Now, this does not happen often, but I actually read some of the literature for this. It's kind of a rare occasion where I can actually read books or stories to back up what a movie's based on. But this one I could not ignore. I wanted to know more about this book, how different it is compared to the animation and what this movie presents, because this scene, just full on stop, it, the, the tone of the movie, it's whiplash. You go from colorful, goofy Adam and Eve all the way down to an existential angel named Satan. That's a 180 if I've ever seen one. So I read some of the book. I read the first 50 pages. And there are already differences between the movie and the book. First off, the book is about these three kids in Austria. It's back, I believe, during the 18th century, I believe. And these three kids run into another kid. And this kid is like beautiful. He's intoxicating. He's, he makes the other kids feel comfortable. And the kid's like, yeah, um, my name is Satan. I'm an angel. And building up to that part in the book, these kids are like, we've heard about angels in the area and also ghosts, but we did not expect to run into one. And from that point on, the angel starts to talk to them about like, yes, I know everything. I'm 16,000 years old. Oh, yes, my uncle Satan, because technically it's not the Satan. It's a kid who is part of the family Satan. And he's like, oh, yeah, my uncle, you know, he's he messed up, but the family's fine. And you see this character perform these miracles where he can read the minds of the kids. The kids can like feel comfortable where they can't really explain it, where they're just delighted to be around him. They they never felt better in their life. And Satan then creates the people out of the dirt. And then as we see in the movie here in a moment, he squashes them without caring. And that really scared the kids because they thought, oh no, these little people, they have souls and now they're going to hell. But then Satan in the book is like, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, that wasn't wrong. I don't know what wrong is because I'm without sin. And that's where the movie kind of picks up with that sentiment of you've got a character who you would think is like, I'm the devil with my pitchfork and my red horns. No, not this character. What we have here is one of the most unique takes on Satan I've ever seen. Again, it's technically not Satan, but you get the point. So the scene starts off with this sad, depressed Mark Twain walking out of the holodeck. And he hits us with one of his quotes about how life is but a vapor, I believe. And the only certain thing is oblivion. So off the bat, we're already getting an existential smack in the face. And then the kids see Satan at the door. Now, something worth noticing here is this version of Satan, it doesn't look anything like the one from the book. This one has a white jester mask. It's got a suit of armor. It has no physical body. But the mask itself is the face and it contorts. It's just brilliant. This design is incredible and it's completely unique to the film. So massive props to the folks who made this movie and going in this direction because I think it's a lot more effective than Satan being a kid. Oh, wow. Please come in. in. So we go in, it's a floating island and it's in the middle of nothing just floating in the darkness. Satan's like, what do you all like to eat? He makes them some fruit. Then he's like, hey, let's build some people, which is again, that's from the book. They build little soldiers, a castle, a little cow. And that's when the really dark, disturbing stuff starts to kick in, where Satan is like, you all are such a worthless lot, such strange customs. 
and you see his face becoming, I say his, its face, becoming more contorted and just messed up because it's seeing these people fighting over a cow. And as we see, it's symbolic. It's absolutely symbolic to humanity, how we fight over things. The way that they see these small little mud people is how God or any creature who's in power, like a divine being, sees humanity. We're nothing. We're just bugs. We're just nothing to them. And there's even a part in the book where it, 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 they didn't really do it like this in the movie. Because in the movie, you've got the two people complaining and Satan is like squashing them deliberately with his hand. In the book, they describe it more that Satan's talking to the kids as the two people fight. And Satan doesn't even break eye contact with the kids. He's still talking and he just takes his hand, smashes the people and doesn't even pay them any attention. It's the equivalent of somebody eating a sandwich seeing a bug on their counter and just squishing it without thinking a second thought because it means nothing to them. And that's the point. These people, these humans, these little creatures mean nothing to Satan because in the same way that humans mean nothing in this particular occasion to whoever is the creator or divine being. Whew, that really shakes you up. And Tom Sawyer and Huck and Becky, they're really messed up over it. They're like, you killed him. Oh, no. And you've got the little pastor clay creature coming out and praying over the coffin, the people mourning, and it just upsets Satan even more and more. And then a direct quote from the book, we'll have a storm now and an earthquake if you'd like. And then he just kills them all and they all die. And the kids are really messed up over it. And then Satan hits them with two more quotes from the book being, we can make more if we need them. Not if we want to, if we need them. You murdered them. Never mind them. People are of no value. We could make more sometime if we need them. So to summarize it all, this scene gives me goosebumps. I'm a person who struggles with existential dread. I mean, I guess everyone does to a degree, but this scene in particular kind of hits it in the right spot where it freaks me out at times, but it's also such a beautiful way to explore it, to see existence from the perspective of this creature who thinks nothing of you. And it's scary and it's disturbing. And oh my God, what's it doing in a kid's movie? But here we are, you know, here's Satan and it's killing people on screen. I, I can't imagine being a kid watching this when I was young. I fortunately saw it when I was an adult. So I had an adult mind to be able to process this. But man, my heart breaks for the children who watched this back in the day and were like, what just happened? That all being said, the scene was beautifully executed. Usually I don't care for tone shifts where it like spins on a dime like this. But in this regard, it's just mwah, chef's kiss, magnificent. And also, it's kind of funny to see them using clay to build the people in the books. And you have claymation being used to build the people in the movie by claymation characters. There's some poetry there, and I love it. So after that, the kids are really messed up. They're like, we've got to get out of here. Mark Twain is a crazy man. He wants to get us killed. We've got to take over the boat. We've got to get out of here. And we continue on with the dark side of Mark Twain, where you have him arguing in a library, like complaining to God. You've got him playing this organ, I believe, and how depressing that sounds. And you're really catching the feel that Mark Twain was a very divided person between being an optimist and being a pessimist, which I fully understand why, since we know his history and what he's been through. The next segment of the movie we jump into is about Captain Stormfield and how he goes to heaven. He too is chasing Haley's Comet and on accident arrives at heaven, but at the wrong heaven. It is like this alien version. And he's in line trying to get in, talking to the alien version of St. Peter, who is like, well, I don't know you. I don't know San Francisco. What's California? You know, whatever, go on in. And as he went in, he's like, where's my hymn book? Where's my Bible? And they're like, what are you talking about? Just go in. And when he goes in, he sees a bunch of aliens like making out. He got one wearing a shirt that said, let's grok, which is like, you know, come on. <laughs> it's fantastic. These aliens are living it up in their heaven. They're partying hard. And then Captain Stormfield's like, I want to go to human heaven. He goes there. They're shushing him. He gets what he wants. And it ends with the quote from Mark Twain saying, 
go to heaven for climate, I believe, and go to hell for company. And, you know, here's the actual quote so you can hear it from the man himself. Heaven for climate, hell for company. After that, we get to the last big story. We've got Adam and Eve wrapping up their diary. You got Eve who partook in the apple, partook, partakes, whatever. She ate it. Uh, hey, we got two Satans in this movie. The jester face that's terrifying and disturbing, and then this cool looking snake with sunglasses. How about that? Congratulations, my dear. You have discovered the law of gravity. <laughs> Why, so I have. Once more, I think that this particular story in the movie drags a bit, it's a bit slow. I think it's charming that you see how Adam and Eve, who are new humans, are trying to understand the world, trying to wrap their minds around each other, children, raising a family, understanding the sin they committed with the tree of knowledge, how they were kicked out of Eden, and how they rolled with the punches and started a family. Which, by the way, look at the family. You got all these cute kids. And for those who don't know, Cain and Abel were the first two children that were born, biblically speaking, from Adam and Eve. And those are the two who would go on where I believe Cain killed Abel. So Cain's like the evil one in the family. Look how the movie has Cain. He's a biker. Look at this guy. I, I love it. This movie and how it wants to interpret characters from Mark Twain's writings, from the Bible, all the way down to Satan. It is magnificent. I love it. So we get to the final part of our movie where you have the steamboat taking off after Halley's Comet. The kids talk about how they're like, we don't want to die. Mark Twain's like, what are you talking about? You're not going to die. And then we come face to face with Omega Twain. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, so that mysterious figure I mentioned before, that is, <laughs> you know how I said that Mark Twain was divided? Well, this movie takes that literally. You've got Alpha Twain, who is like the optimistic person who is loving and caring and has a bright outlook on humanity and existence. And then you've got Omega Twain, who is the one who walked out of the mysterious stranger and also, fun fact, walked into the holodeck for the damned human race, which really sells you on this man, Mark Twain, was very divided on his feelings when it came to humanity where he liked parts of it, but he fully understood that we are a really messed up species. When I get over on the other side, I want to use my influence to have the human race drown again. This time, drown good. No omission. No art. That's the end, basically, where you have Omega Twain talking to Alpha Twain. It's a very cathartic moment because we're getting all these different types of tone in the movie, being the bright side, being the dark side, and they join together. It's like you have Mark Twain kind of talking about accepting death and that there is a fear of what if there is nothing after this? And that's what Omega Twain is talking about. And that's where I believe like the mysterious stranger came from. That kind of story came from Omega Twain. And then you have Alpha Twain who's like, I am fully inclined to think that there is something after this. And, you know, and if there's not, don't be a sissy. Let's go. And that's really like the full sentiment of the movie. That's what I took away from it. This movie does a great job of showing you the different levels of Mark Twain and what he thought and what he felt and what he believed in, whether it be with God or that there is no God with how you write a story about kids with Tom Sawyer and it's more happy-go-lucky, which also has its dark sides. We have something as disturbing and as existential as a mysterious stranger and something that is as charming, well, as the movie puts it, as the diaries of Adam and Eve. This was a very complicated man and this movie did a great job of capturing that and also showcasing it visually. And then we get the final scene of the movie, and it's just downright gorgeous. You've got Mark Twain's face in the clouds. It is a work of art. It is beautiful. And that was the conclusion of the movie. And I thought, what a fitting finale. Well done. Against the assault of laughter, <laughs> nothing can stand. All right, let's go over my five points. First, the story. 
It is wonderful that I was able to discover more about the writings of Mark Twain because of this film. Going into it, I had no idea about the Adam and Eve diary. I did not know about the mysterious stranger outside of the clip. I did not know anything about the jumping bullfrog. There are so many things about Mark Twain that I had no idea about. And to see it in a film and to actually be inspired to look more into it, that's a testament to the film. Again, I read part of a book for this video. That's how into it I was. As the movie goes, it's a very unique take because it's basically an anthology of Mark Twain's writings to visit the different worlds he's created. He's basically God in this movie, where you have this, as I call him, Alpha Twain, and then you have the dark side of Mark, the Omega Twain, and that really does speak to the audience. A bullfrog, Adam and Eve, oh, these are happy-go-lucky things, the mysterious stranger, the damned human race, these are the darker sides, the more pessimistic thoughts of Mark. And to go throughout the movie and discover that, to see that this mysterious figure is Mark, that was very satisfying. Come on out and show yourself. <laughs> there you go, scaring everybody again. Scott, you look. haunted me long enough. The plot of the movie being that this is Mark Twain basically dying. That's interesting. You see his different writings what kind of person he is because of each story. Because each story is a part of Mark. That's a part of his heart, his soul, his mind, his beliefs in those stories. Even the main characters of Huck and Tom and Becky represent that. They were surprised to see the mysterious stranger and that kind of dark side of Mark being creations of Mark themselves. And the kids themselves, they don't really have any huge arcs. They go on the boat because they're seeking adventure. They want to make a name for themselves. They get in over their heads and their entire role is for us, the audience, to walk in their shoes and go around the insane world that is Mark Twain and his writings. Mark Twain himself though, you see the polar opposites and when they share quotes, you got like Alpha Twain with his optimistic quotes, his more lighthearted stuff. And then you got Omega Twain with his more existential dread thoughts of religion. What is existence at all? So I catch both of those in the movie and I love it. And it all coalesces at the end with Alpha Twain and Omega Twain fusing into Super Saiyan Twain. Fusion. Stay with it. Next, there's the voice acting. So the kids themselves, they were fine. They did their jobs. Nothing that knocked my socks off, but it was of satisfaction. But you've got James Whitmore, and he knocked it out of the park. James himself is an actor with an illustrious career. He was in Planet of the Apes. He has a fantastic voice. When I hear him talk in the movie, it's like, you could have fooled me. You sound like, as I would imagine, Mark Twain would sound like. Fun fact, we don't know what he sounds like because he never recorded his voice. But as far as James Whitmore and his performance, I thought it was just magnificent. He nailed it. Shucks, I could write a better story than that. And Tom. That's what I said myself when I heard it. It was a big success all the same. I became a writer. I have worked the day since. Oh, and by the way, another fun fact, for Satan's voice, you have a guy's voice, which I believe is Will Vinton, and also a girl's voice recording the same lines and combined. And that was the voice of Satan. Will said that he wanted the voice to sound more androgynous. Now in the book, again, it's different, but for the movie, as far as how Will and his team wanted to interpret this scene, fantastic. And I love that this sequence is once more in a kid's movie that was rated G. Even the folks who made it were like, uh, should this be rated G? I think it should be PG. And the distributors are like, shut up, just go, release it, who cares? How do you learn to do that? I didn't learn it at all. It comes naturally to me, like other curious things. Next, there's the dialogue. 
I like that the kids, for Tom and Huck and Becky, they seem so innocent. They really are just these empty-headed protagonists who, you know, they're yearning for adventure, but they really are just there to observe and learn and see what Mark Twain and his magical airship has to offer. You go to the jumping bullfrog, you go to <laughs> Satan, and you get a good vibe of the exchange of these characters talking to the other fictional characters and sharing their thoughts. It was fine, good dialogue. But the best part of all was just Mark Twain and how they directly use quotes from Mark Twain in this movie. I think it adds a lot to the film, goes to show you that the folks who made this movie understood Mark and how they wanted to roll him out in their animated movie. So me and Huck was thinking we should set her down and let Becky off. Things are liable to get pretty rough. There is nothing comparable to the endurance of a woman. But this is different, Mr. Twain. Editing. It was fine. Good sound effects, wonderful music, and not to brag too much on the mysterious stranger, but the music and sounds they use for that scene complements it so much. Very well mixed, very well done. Oh, by the way, it's worth mentioning. There is a rumor that the Satan sequence was banned from television. Guess what? That is not true. Will Vinson is on record saying that's false. So yeah. I suppose that was just some kind of rumor. Hold on there, keep that manuscript. Won't be published for years yet. And finally, we have the animation. What can I say? It's magnificent. You got an animated feature film from the father of Claymation. What else could you want? It is incredible seeing all the hard work they put into this movie and how they move the characters, how they designed them with Huck and Tom and Becky. You've got the mysterious stranger where they decided we'll try something different here. We're not going to make it seem like a kid from the book. We're going to try something of our own. And that was incredibly effective. Actually, I think it elevates it even more. There's definitely a creative touch to all of the scenes as far as the setting goes. Everything just completely slams. And it's such a unique experience. Hang on. Okay. All right, how would I improve it? I, I wouldn't touch it. Just leave it alone. Even with some of the imperfections that I did notice, I think those imperfections add to the overall charm of the movie. It makes the movie feel more, <laughs> and I keep saying this over and over, it makes it feel more unique. Mark Twain Adventures stands out from all of these other films because of what it's about, how they wanted to present it, and how they basically saw it through. I can't really think of another movie that comes close to this. A claymation anthology? That is truly one of a kind. So even though the Adam and Eve scene drags to me a bit, I say, leave it in. It's fine, it's forgivable, and if anything, it only adds to the overall experience. What's a classic? Something everybody wants to have read, but nobody wants to read. In conclusion, the Adventures of Mark Twain is an incredibly unique film with its story, its visuals, and its origin. Real talk, I am so glad that more people are watching these clips on YouTube and are asking themselves, what's this from? Because as amazing as the mysterious stranger scene is, it's just a small slice of the entire experience. And I think that watching the entire film amplifies the mysterious stranger. Once again, Props to Will Venton and for what he achieved with this movie. And also in the field of animation, you made something truly unique and hopefully more people will give this movie a chance. Hey folks, thanks again for watching this video. Sub for more uploads like this if you want. A big shout out to my Patreons, my YouTube members. Y'all are awesome. Thank you for the support. It was fun watching this movie. It was an enjoyable experience to review it and it's been long overdue. It's also nice to review something that's good every so often, so that was nice. All right, thanks again for watching. See you all next time.